Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Natasha Monroe coming to you from a sunny and unusually warm Fort Worth, Texas. Today I'll be sharing with you something very near and dear to my heart, so I appreciate you being here. I'm fully aware you likely have a jam-packed schedule, so without further ado, let's get started. So our presentation today is titled Immigration Experience Through Their Eyes, Phenomenological Research of Peruvian Adults in the United States. Here is a little bit about me. Uh, first of all, I am a pretty new adjunct instructor here at Ashford University. I am thoroughly loving the course that I'm getting to teach. It's Gen 499, which is a general education capstone course where I get to challenge upper level students to do some major <laughs> legitimate academic level research uh, regarding global social issues. So I'm loving it. I was excited to learn about this online conference and about opening a discussion on this topic that I'm very passionate about. I enjoy studying and implementing phenomena from the positive psychology approach. Also, I am a licensed professional counselor and consultant here in Texas, and I enjoy empowering clients who have anxiety and trauma-related challenges in their life, uh, as well as through consulting work. And I'm also a U.S. Army veteran with multiple deployments, and I'm still in the reserves, very close to my 20-year retirement date. And I think very importantly, I need to mention I'm also a relatively new mom of an amazing little young woman. So, um, again, I include all that to show that we are complex, right? We're not just a one thing in our lives. Uh, the primary goals for this presentation is to build a more complete schema for immigrant student, to increase appreciation of complexity and positivity on this topic, and to inspire improved communication with our immigrant student population. So in 2015-2016, I conducted an independent phenomenological research endeavor on the topic of immigration experience, specifically of Peruvians in the United States. From that research, I learned so much that can be useful to others in better understanding the immigrant experience. And as a college educator, I wanted to share this perspective with others uh, in hopes of increasing awareness, and inspiring a refreshing perspective of the immigrant student, uh, their learning experience and what they might bring to the classroom. So, oh, here we go. This is an education session, you guys. So it's pre-test time. Before we get started, I want you to ask yourself a few questions. To get the most out of this, have a piece of paper out and jot down your answers. Feel free to pause the presentation as you write or in between sections. Take your time, don't rush. All right, so here we go. As the question is asked, I want you to pay attention to two things. The first one is perhaps the most important. Uh, what comes to mind immediately when these questions come up? Singular words and images might pop into your head. Emotions might as well, so jot them down quickly. Uh, no complete sentences are necessary. What comes to mind as you continue to think about the question? Was there a change from that immediate response? Did you have to, to alter anything from your immediate reaction on purpose? Write down your thoughts, spend a little bit more time on that second part. So the question is gonna pop up. Uh, I want you to jot down quickly what comes to your mind immediately, and then sit and think about it a while and write that stuff down too. The point here is not to point out any wrong or right answers, that's not the goal here. Uh, I just want you to be aware of whatever comes to your mind. This is meant to give us a starting point, to offer some self-assessment, and also to, okay, I'm not gonna lie. You're an educator too, so you know what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm also trying to pique your interest and hopefully increase comprehension on the topic. So, are you ready? Here we go. Question one, what comes to mind when you see or hear this? Immigrant. Jot down your answers. Immediate and reflective answer. Question number two, what comes to mind when you he hear or see this? Peruvian immigrant. Question three, 
what is a college educational experience like for an immigrant? Question four. Imagine reading a discussion post of a student who mentions he is originally from Tanzania. What does your discussion response say to him in the forum? Okay, so pause, give your answers. All right, now you should be pushing play again. So first of all, let's define the word immigrant. Immigrant, so this is an appropriate collective term for anyone foreign born who moves to another country to live. This term includes people who go through legal and documented processes such as citizenship or green card, as well as people who have not. So in my research, for example, participant legal status ranged from US citizen to legal residency status to no legal or documented status at all. All right, so back to our questions. So what came to your mind? when you when you heard or saw the word immigrant did you picture this hmm maybe not right albert einstein um originally not from the us <laughs> from europe but uh, born in germany and then how about this this is anne elizabeth or also known better as liz claiborne from belgium first female chair and ceo of fortune 500 company in the us how about this guy Oscar de la Renta, originally from the Dom uh, Dom Dominican Republic. And how about Madeleine Albright, originally from the country now known as Czech Republic, first female US Secretary of State. And how about these guys? You might not recognize them if I hadn't put that background behind them, right? So on the right, you see Steve Chen, he's originally from Taiwan. And you see Javid Karim, uh, originally from East Germany. These are founders of YouTube who are immigrants. So most people don't picture these types of people when the word immigrant comes up. Why is that? Uh, I will get into that, the brain and the cognition aspect of that question, what do we picture and why? I'll get into that in my November presentation, so I hope you guys tune into that. Um, but for now, just kind of let's move on. Um, I have a question too. What came to mind when you heard or saw Peruvian immigrant? Did you have the same image in mind or think the same things? Did anything differ? How so? Okay. Question three. What about what is a college educational experience like for an immigrant? Did you picture this? Did you picture this? Did you picture this? <laughs> All right. So just some food for thought. And then how about question four, a student from Tanzania? Uh, for instance, would you have made a remark or comment about the student being from Tanzania? Did you make it a point to encourage him to share his international perspective in class or ask him his perspective on the topic to see if it was unique? Or did you notice any evidence of personal strength or a personal struggle in his post that you may want to keep in mind? Just, you know, these are just some food for thought types of questions and we're gonna revisit these later. Okay. So here's a little background, research, uh, background information on the research. So in my travels to the country of Peru, I was inspired by what appeared to be an interwoven cultural resilience of sorts. I met all kinds of Peruvians from all walks of life, and I kept seeing this logical, uh, not dwelling on the worst of things mentality that I just really admired. I was already interested in learning about the topic of resilience and mental health. So when it was time to decide what to study for my doctoral dissertation, this was a no brainer to me. I wanted to research the resilience of Peruvians. Well, long story short, literature review can be a downer, right? <laughs> I quickly found there was very little and in many cases zero research uh, emphasizing the things I was so interested in about Peruvians, specifically in the English language and not a whole lot in Spanish either actually. So great, a gap in literature to fill. That's an amazing thing for dissertation purposes, right? Well, the lack of literature in my area of interest was to the point I couldn't in good conscience focus on the resilience study <laughs> uh, before first addressing the need for more foundational research on Peruvians in the United States. This led me to the immigration angle. So in 2010, immigration was not the hot topic of mainstream media that it is today, but due to being in an international program, I had gained an appreciation for the challenges many US immigrants face. So I thought, hey, great, let's merge these two topics, right? Okay, 
So there is a method of my madness, I promise. Here's when it starts becoming directly relevant to today's presentation in the educational angle. So I started researching about US immigrants more and more specifically uh, Peruvian immigrants, sure enough, I saw a different theme peeking through than immigration in general. There, uh, the theme that was emerging wasn't one of challenge, as we so often see emphasized in mainstream media and in politics, and often for good reason, don't get me wrong, but instead of seeing an underemployed immigrant in need of assistance, I was seeing a theme of self-sufficiency and positivity. So check this out. I found statistics of Peruvian immigrants thriving. This appealed to the positive psychologist to me, so I was excited. There is much to be learned from what is going well with a successful immigrant or a successful immigrant group, yet research is undeniably focused on what is going wrong, okay? So this is definitely something that needed to be re researched more, and I was honored to do it. So these are the research questions that I found myself asking for the study, and here are some slides for you fellow research nerds out there. I'm just gonna fly through these. You can glance on them uh, and pause if you'd like, if you're interested. We'll point out a few things. Here's the iterative data analytic process mo model. It's really interesting to use. So <laughs> the data coding, it, it was a monster. Uh, I'll be honest with you, it was a lot more complicated than I thought it would be. Good qualitative research is not necessarily easier than quantitative. Okay, reminder of the research questions. So here are a few themes that emerged, four major themes. Here are the focus codes by themes. And I wanna point a little bit of this out because it has to do with uh, education related uh, topics. So on emotional responses, check out that. You, you will see some things such as loneliness, longing, fear, frustration, and shock. But I also want you to see the others. Now these are in alphabetical order, not by prevalence, but these are the main themes that came up over and over and over with my participants. Appreciation, happiness, optimism, pride, of all the emotions out there. And, and these are collective terms and lots of other things fell under these. But, I, but that just you know, proves the resilience and what we're uh, interested to find in this study. Also, we tried to make it very uh, neutral. So in how we asked the questions, we didn't say, hey, what's great about the US? No, we were very neutral and we asked, what if any challenges did you have? What if any support did you have? What advice would you give others? So the, the questioning was very strategic in other words. So yes, here are some challenges that the immigrants, immigrants had in who were participants in my study. Environmental factors, there were two cases of exploitation, although it was very rare in the study, two were brought up about um, exploited workers in the Pacific Northwest, and also one incident of uh, a nanny being underpaid because she didn't know what kind of wages to ask for. So language barriers, right? Spanish-speaking Peruvians. Uh, that was probably the number one thing that came up. They just mentioned it a lot. But also look at their perspectives. Land of opportunity that came up over and over and over in this study. Uh, also some interesting views on the U.S. macroculture. Uh, I'll be honest, specifically, they kind of said, hey, I don't understand what people are griping about all the time. Uh, they kind of described us as whining. <laughs> uh, in a very nice way, though, the Peruvians in general tend to be a little bit more mannered and how they word things, and also safety advantages. Anyway, don't wanna get into that too much, but very interesting. That's more stuff. Mention this. And when, when they were talking about frustrations, this is very important. This is a huge thing of the study. One of the, probably the major takeaways, one of the major takeaways of the study is their frustration with what I call cultural identity theft over and over the participants mentioned frustration with not being recognized for who they are. So that's something that we're gonna get into a little bit more here in the presentation. All right, so here we go. So here's a little bit more on immigration research. 
just a reminder before we get started, my aim for sharing my Peruvian immigration study is to emphasize the more positive aspects of immigration and to increase awareness of the complexity of the topic and distinctions among immigrant groups. This is by no means an attempt to ignore or minimize the more negative or challenging aspects of immigration experience. You may very well have an immigrant student who has experienced struggle or who may need assistance. So of course, be aware of that possibility as well. But I want to point out immigrant students, right? Okay, you have an immigrant student. But that same consideration will go for any of your students, right? Of course. So. Again, don't box in your immigrant student to negative stereotypes based off of information that you have. Um, that's why I'm presenting here a whole flip side of the story that's ever bit as real. Oftentimes in our US culture, we only hear agenda-driven information. However, I feel this positive psychology angle of identifying and acknowledging some of the positives found among our nation's immigrant population is just as relevant because it's just as relevant. I don't want to steal too much thunder from my November presentation. That will be more about immigration in general, but I will be mentioning a few statistics here that are not proven specific, just so you're aware. During the time of my research, it was completed in 2016, uh, there was some of the interesting US immigrant data and how Peruvian statistics factor into it. This information came primarily from the US Census Bureau, US Department of Homeland Security, the U.S. Center for Immigration Studies, as well uh, Immigration Report, as well as some other studies and data points that were smaller. Noteworthy statistics. Here we go, y'all. Interesting stuff. Noteworthy statistics show Peruvian immigrants outperforming virtually every other national group in several areas, such as low poverty rates. At the time, there was a poverty rate of around 10 to 13 percent for Peruvian immigrants. So is that good or bad, you're asking? Well, let's look at that. Let's compare it to other groups. Uh, it is as much as 20% lower than Honduran, Mexican, or Guatemalan immigrants, respectively. Those are the top three poverty experiencing groups. But what might surprise you even more? This next little statistics. Hmm. So poverty levels among Peruvian immigrants at this time are actually lower than the general US non-immigrant population. What? Yeah, what's up with that, right? And then even more interestingly is that um, they're, they're significantly lower than Hispanic immigrants in the US. Peruvians poverty rate is actually lower than Iranians, Russians, Chinese, Japanese, and yeah, slightly lower than the US population of non-immigrants. Would you have guessed that? And how about, those of you who are interested in this, right? Education. So education rates of bachelor's degree are higher. I do want to point out uh, immigration statistics are really uh, tough to solidify. You can look at one research, and I found that to be a headache in my, in my study. Uh, you look at one report, and it says this. Another report says that. So the, the statistics that I decide to go with and that I'm emphasizing are the best from the research that we could come up with from scholarly, good, respected sources, and they're not outliers, let's say. But you might find uh, percentages a little different than this. So yeah, 31% of Peruvians in the US had a bachelor's degree or higher. Guess what? That's slightly better than the general US population of non-immigrants, and it's significantly higher than Hispanic US population. So, interesting, right? <laughs> These statistics basically knock so many stereotypes out of the water, right? Stereotypes uh, or things that people actually believe, such as English as a second language equals educational hindrance. Not true. Can it affect it? Sure, but it doesn't have to hinder it. Discrimination. Um, if you're discriminated against, then you have a vast need and use of government support, right? Well, not necessarily. You don't have white privilege, well, that must equate underemployment, right? Well, not according to a lot of statistics out there. And what about if you're an immigrant, you have to be experiencing poverty, right? The answer is no. The answer is no. In the study, interesting, interestingly, my professors even suggested I somehow just happened to interview successful Peruvians who were atypical immigrants. Some of them were not experts in immigration. Uh, even though my recruitment methods were chosen very deliberately to not just find one type of participant, 
But then when I revealed to them the immigration statistics, we saw that no, the research I did actually was compatible with trends, that these trends just are not emphasized and they're pretty unknown. So my question was, what the heck is up with Peruvians? What can we learn from them to help less successful immigrant groups? So what is the relevancy, that's where we're all getting at, to the educational setting? We've probably already had some takeaways. <laughs> Uh, but basically, I want to focus on the awareness of three major things. Uh, my question for the purpose of this presentation is, what can teachers learn from this Peruvian study that can further empower their teaching and their students? And I mean immigrant students and non-immigrant students, our educational environment overall. While there are many answers to that question, so many I barely have time to touch uh, the surface on this presentation. My overall answer is awareness. So number one, the danger of cultural identity theft. I wanna emphasize the distinction between diversity awareness versus stereotyping and microaggression. There is a presentation on microaggression. I was really excited to see that. So I encourage everybody to check that out. Um, definitely pretty excited. But um, that goes for any student, right? And it's important to immigration related trauma, of course, yes. But again, we need to look out for um, not appreciating the individuality of all students. One participant of my study emphasized his observations that people in the United States did not often, uh, were not often aware of the existence of cultural and historical distinctions between the different countries in Central and South America. I heard this over and over in the research. Uh, in his own words, that's what's important, right? I don't like paraphrasing. So the main point of my phenomenological study was I wanted things to be found and interpreted through their words. So there's very little interpretation on my part. It was all about their words. So this participant, one thing he said was American people, especially white people, African Americans also, they think that if you're Hispanic, you're Mexican. And if you're Mexican, you're illegal. The majority of the participants expressed similar experiences at various points in their interviews. So don't take away individuality and uniqueness and distinction of any student, but here we're talking about the immigrant student. Notice if you're lumping students all into one group, okay? So let's try not to do that. It can be offensive to the student as it was with pretty much every participant, well, I think every participant mentioned it, and I didn't prompt for those questions either. So you don't want to offend your students, you don't want to limit student-teacher and even peer relationships, and the power of suggestion can be powerful. You know, know your place. You're a college instructor. If you automatically think of them as not capable or behind the other students, their brain might soak that up a little bit, and we don't want that. Also, the awareness of positive responses to the immigration experiences. Yeah, your students um, also have appreciation, optimism, and pride. The emotional focus codes that emerge, emerged in my study were those. Uh, I want to point out that appreciation, optimism, and pride are what struck me as perhaps the most prevalent, as well as the most valuable lessons that I learned from the Peruvian participants. While shock was the most commonly mentioned, it was not the emotion that was dwelled upon. It simply appeared from time to time, especially at the beginning of the immigration experience recollections, and then quickly faded away as the other emotions took over, as well as logic. It's also interesting to note that what constituted optimism for the participants might not seem so obviously so in our U.S. macroculture. So the optimism shared by the Peruvians was not rainbows and butterflies and laughter, but it was more reality-based, if that makes any sense. So this is also consistent with positive psychology approach to understanding mental and emotional well-being through global endeavors, such as key studies by University of Pennsylvania researchers, Dr. Martin Seligman, Dr. Karen Rivich, both of whom I've had the pleasure of working with briefly in 2011. This to me differed from what most often is heard among non-immigrants in the United States, where tendency seems to be to focus more on negativity, external blame or justification, and individualism, which is not necessarily linked to positive mental health outcomes, I might add. So enough on that. Number three, awareness of limitations of assuming or suggesting the worst. Uh, when we do that, we can weaken our student, we can weaken the educational experience for them, and we can also miss out on fostering growth and diverse thought. 
Our job as educators, it's not to suggest limitations or to weaken, right? It's to facilitate growth and prepare for success. There's no real advantage to assuming the worst for a student other than you know, being able to offer empathy and of course, supportive resources, yes. But there's much more opportunity for empowerment and education by emphasizing and integrating the strengths of our immigrant students, specifically when we're talking about uh, global considerations in our, in our career and professional endeavors, something that's very important to us at Ashburg, right? All right, so the time has come to an end. It's time to wrap things up. So let's revisit those questions from earlier. I want you to think, what comes to mind now? Here are those questions. Did your experience in answering these questions differ in comparison to just a half an hour ago? My guess would be yes. If not, then you either were maybe simultaneously watching an episode of This Is Us, or I might need to step up my game in presenting. On either account, I hope I was able to affect your schema for immigrant students in a positive way, at least a little bit. So now that we've breached the wall of complexity that is immigration experience, I hope you're ready for my challenge to you. You ready? All right, I think you are. All right, my challenge to you is to create three goals for improving communication with your immigration students. So, um, I would love for each of you to create those goals, and I think you'll find this will be pretty easy and natural to do now that your brain is primed for the task, right? So here are some ideas. Uh, I do consider imitation flattering, so please feel free to make these your own. Uh, so these are some ideas. So grading feedback, uh, it's more private. So in your grading feedback with your immigrant students, you can encourage them to give their unique uh, perspective on the topics. And I like the word unique, and I encourage you to use that instead of different or cultural. This is better than in the discussion forum if the student has not mentioned being foreign born openly to the class, for instance. Some students might be shy or might not want to be treated differently, who knows. Discussion replies. So in discussion forum, uh, if the student is, has already mentioned being foreign born in the forums, invite him or her to share their perspective. So in your response to them, please uh, be sure to do so in a non-biased and in a curious manner. For instance, you could say, Jennifer, being that you're from Peru, I wonder if you had noticed anything interesting or any similarities or differences on this topic. So again, you want to phrase it so it's not biased, and you want to phrase it so it's kind of curious, so kind of welcoming. Uh, the next one, don't be a jerk, basically. So avoid ethnocentric or ignorant or stereotyping or negatively based verbiage or remarks such as, okay, let's think of some bad examples here. Um, you hear this stuff a lot, actually, unfortunately. Wow, I bet you're glad to be living in the United States, right? That's not nice, and maybe they're not, and who knows why they're here, and What's so great about here? You know, you don't want to imply that. Uh, also, oh, it must have been traumatic growing up in Somalia. That's based on what you've seen, you know, on our politically <laughs> motivated, agenda-ridden me. I'm getting on a soapbox. You don't know what it's like in Somalia unless you've visited there, right? So you don't know what's traumatic or what's not. So don't make statements such as that that are leading. Personal research, take it upon yourself to research the country and its US immigration statistics of, you know, of your uh, immigrant student. If they mention they're from Ghana, research a little bit about Ghana just so that you're aware. Uh, that way, if a conversation comes up, you're a little bit more educated on it. I'll get into that and how to do that a little bit more in my November presentation, by the way. Uh, another idea, always send an email. So if a student, if it, is brought to your attention that this student is an immigrant. Specifically, if they're new, you could say, send an email some, that says something like, welcome, and, and then even if they're not a new immigrant, but just send a quick email and encourage them to bring up their unique, again, that word, unique perspective, not different perspective. It might not be different at all, who knows? Um, might not be unique, but unique's kind of a different connotation. So you might encourage them to bring up that unique perspective in class, especially in global or international conversations. Point out 
that you want his or her peers to learn from him or her. Email is a great personal touch and it opens up the dialogue. Um, and also if the student is struggling with anything, um, then that opens up that dialogue as well. And also if they want to engage more, you just welcome them to do it. So you don't have to be an expert on every nationality and every culture out there in the world. That's pretty impossible to do, right? No, you just want to have, um, you just want to open up the dialogue basically, and you don't want to limit it by not doing so. So that's pretty much it. <clears throat> so again, thank you guys. I do want uh, this presentation focused on the experiences of Peruvian immigrants in one study. My November 9th presentation will be more about uh, empowering you, the instructor, and working with immigrant students who may be in your class. I'll be offering some current U.S. immigration statistics to inform and increase awareness. And I'll also be pointing out valuable websites for you uh, to use for quick future reference. We'll also discuss important and maybe even uncomfortable topics, such as the distinction between cultural and national awareness and competency and stereotyping. Uh, how to recognize your immigrant students, how to appropriately assist them if they're having difficulties, and my personal favorite, how to foster the opportunity for the immigrant student to interact in ways that will further enhance the educational experience, not just for them, yes, for them too, but not just for them, but for the entire class. So that's it, guys. Uh, this concludes my presentation for today. Thank you sincerely for your time and your attention. We at Ashford realize the importance of recognizing and prioritizing global considerations. So we absolutely must not miss this golden opportunity to effectively integrate our immigrant students. I'm excited and honored to be leading a discussion on the topic in November, and I hope to see you all there. All right, bye.